Hello. So in this video, we're going to talk about Gerald Beisner's, let me talk that so you can, there we go, Gerald Beisner's epic poem, Bear Island, The War at Sugar Point. Um, now I call this an epic poem. Perhaps mock epic is more accurate, and we'll we'll talk about why that might be a more accurate term in just a little bit. Um, so this is a stylized retelling of the final battle of the Indian Wars, fought between the U.S. government and various indigenous peoples throughout the latter portion of the 19th century, mostly after the U.S. Civil War. Um, so this would include famous events like the massacre at Wounded Knee or Custer's Last Stand, but it also includes lesser-known events like the war at Sugar Point. Um, in, uh, so in this book, there is a preface. Preface? I think it's called a preface. Uh, forward. So there's a forward, and then there's Weisner's introduction, both of which tell the series of events and some of the background for the war at Sugar Point in more sort of direct, linear fashion before we get to Weisner's actual poem. Uh, snapshot version from the last paragraph of Weisner's introduction pillager warriors. Um, this was a distinct group of um, Ojibwe... Uh, I think it was a, a, a particular clan of the Ojibwe nation, um, also called the Chippewa. Um, the pillager warriors outnumbered more than three to one, routed the soldiers of the 3rd Infantry in a single day, October 5th, 1898. The army casualties were six dead and eleven wounded, a certain defeat seldom mentioned in military histories. So that's the short version of the background. Basically, the longer version of the background. Um, there was a guy... Let me find... Uh, let me find his name in... Ojibwe, because I, I am not going to use the Ojibwe name because I think I'm going to pronounce it wrong. Um, and so if I do, I apologize right off the bat. Um, I want to give it to you once. So, and of course, once you decide you're going to... Ah, okay, here we go. So I think the Ojibwe name is pronounced Buganya Geisha. Probably wrong. Uh, in English, it translates to Hole in the Day. So Hole in the Day was a chief of the, the pillagers. And he had been brought to Duluth, Minnesota to testify basically against somebody who was selling whiskey illegally on indigenous lands. After he testified, um, and it, I mean, his testimony was not well received by the by the judge, as I understand it, because he used a lot of metaphor and storytelling and things like this, and the judge just wanted a sort of straight, linear answer. So, uh, Hole in the Day, after his testimony, was basically left to his own devices to get back to his home at Sugar Point, which was about 100 miles away, and this was during the winter. He was kicked off of a train, basically, before it even actually left Duluth. And so he ended up having to walk the hundred miles back. And so when people from the Indian agency came to get him to testify again, he was like, mm, I'm going to politely decline your offer. And so he, uh, a, a bunch of pillager warriors ended up sort of rescuing him from these guys. They ran off and then they called in the army. The army sent the 3rd Infantry, which was a, a long-seasoned uh, unit that had fought really well in the Spanish-American War shortly before. Um, but they sent a company of about 80 men, um, officers and soldiers, um, many of whom were immigrants. So German, Irish, Swedish, whatever it was. Um, the 3rd Infantry showed up at 
hole in the day hole in the day's place. Uh, they sort of took over his cabin. Then they were surrounded by maybe twenty or so pillager warriors, who. In so, we're going to talk about this because how the war actually started, how the shooting actually started, is controversial. Um, but basically, the pillagers ended up just kicking their asses. Like the the pillagers. Um, killed five soldiers and one officer. Um, and, and as far as anyone knows, took no casualties, no wounded, no kill. I mean, that's a, that's a pretty solid success there. Uh, the, the third infantry then basically retreated. Um, they called up reinforcements, which came with a Gatling gun and the pillagers just weren't there. They left and that was it. That was the end of the war. So, uh, Weisner tells this story in this mock epic form, and I'm going to call it mock epic because I think that actually is a better term for what's going on here. Um, so the difference between an epic and a mock epic basically is that an epic is a sort of grand sweeping story of heroes and cosmic forces, typically gods, immortals, things like this. A mock epic takes the tone and style of a of an epic poem, but the subject matter is much more mundane or sort of narrowly focused. So we will I will justify calling it a mock epic. Um, and I, I don't want people when I say mock epic, I don't want people to think, oh, this is kind of a joke poem, because it isn't. It is doing very serious um, critical work. Um, but I think the, the sort of short, almost comical nature of this war to the extent that there can be anything comical about war, um, I think sort of lends itself to the idea of mock epic. So I want to give you a distinct sense of, um, Weisner's style in this. So I'm going to read you actually the opening couple of stanzas, the first three stanzas. Uh, and this actually is... This actually does align it with the, the epic poetic tradition because we have a creation narrative and we have a um, we have a, a an appeal to the divine, which is very typical of things like um, Homer's Iliad and Odyssey and and other poems like this. So one of the things with Weisner's poem, very short lines. Typically two words per line. So this moves very quickly, actually. So it opens up. And again, if I pronounce any of these indigenous words wrong, I apologize. That's my that's me as a reader, nothing else. Um, the Anishinaabe na natives of the Migas, uh, fugitive rivers, canoe birch, white pine, face the clouds and cedar boughs. Worthy hunters cut the barren masks of hunger, boreal shadows, eternal spirits on the ancient stone. Crafty tricks, trickster, nanabozo, created natives, bears and cranes, muskrats, beaver moves by sorrow and tease, aroused stories, lonesome, uncertain scenes, blue and watery. So we have here, this, again, this origin story, um, the Anishinaabe. Um, the their sort of background as a people. And Anishinaabe, as far as I can tell, is a sort of broad term, including a number of different indigenous groups, including the Ojibwe. Um, and then we've got the appeal to a um, to a divine figure, Nanaboza, who's a who's a traditional trickster figure in sort of The area that's now sort of around the Great Lakes in the U.S. and southern Canada, um, going slightly out into the Great Plains. Uh, Nanobozo is a traditional trickster figure for a number of different cultures in the in that area, um, and so that appeal to a divine 
figure, particularly a divine figure, who's associated with cleverness and with storytelling is really important. This is kind of, in a way, like Homer's appeal to the muses at the beginning of poems like the Iliad or the Odyssey. Um, but then the opening section of Weisner's poem, the overture, ends with this stanza. Duty-bound, ushers and scalpers, pocket stories, traduce the dance, native stories, scenes of presence at the mercy of pious scorn, wicked chanty, confederate cruelty, bound and uh, bounty and hue of wanted genocide by first light, outgunned at sugar point, forever in this book. So the two things that I think are really important here are this, the, the phrase native stories, scenes of presence, and forever in this book. Because one of Weisner's big theoretical ideas is what's called survivance, which is the idea that indigenous people maintain their presence, their identity, and their traditions through um, telling stories that pass on indigenous wisdom, um, indigenous identities, etc., etc. So that's really, really important for Weisner. So um, he, he tells the story throughout the, the poem itself. It is very stylized. You've, got, you've gotten a sense, I think, of his, his writing style in this poem. It's very sort of impressionistic, etc., etc. More about creating resonances or emotional associations than a sort of straight linear narrative description of what's going on. But I want to talk about some of the things we get at the end of this poem, because I think this is this is really an interesting the end I find the most the most interesting, the most fascinating of this. So one thing is we get two different explanations for how the war started. First, we get the white reported version, the version told by the soldiers of the 3rd Infantry, which is basically that uh, they had been ordered to stack their rifles. And basically what you would do, I, I think this was still true by 1898, you sort of tripoded three rifles together with the bayonets. You you hooked two of them and put an, a third one on and swung that through. And basically, it created a reasonably stable tripod. The problem is if you didn't do it correctly, the tripod would fall over. And so what seems to have happened in the white reported version is that um, one of these rifles was left loaded. The safety was not put on it. The tripod fell over and the rifle fired. And after that, the pillager warriors in the tree line uh, sort of took this to be an attack on them, and so they started shooting at the soldiers. Then we get the indigenous version of how the war started, uh, which is that the 3rd Infantry, when they arrived, one of the first things that they did when they arrived at Sugar Point, one of the first things that they did was fired at a canoe full of indigenous women who were coming to plead for the release of somebody who had been wrongly imprisoned, basically. So, uh, that's clearly a much less flattering uh, depiction of the 3rd Infantry in the U.S. military, but not entirely unbelievable, given the very, very questionable treatment of indigenous peoples by uh, the U.S. military and the U.S. Army. So, we also get some depictions of the battle itself here, and I think this is where it becomes really clear that this is a mock epic. Um, the, the battle itself, again, is, is as comical as a war kind of can be. So we get this section here. Lieutenant Ross, commander of the left flank, over the turnips. Major Wilkinson, center of the war, over cabbages. Nurtured that season by holding the day. Colonel Sheehan, right flank, over the potatoes. Exposed to fire, summoned immigrant recruits by their bravery. So, the fact that the geography of this war is a vegetable garden 
makes it very difficult to see this as a sort of grand sweeping battles for for glory and whatnot that you would get with, say, Homer's Iliad or something like this, uh, or Beowulf. Um, even the Epic of Gilgamesh, which doesn't have large-scale battles, but has has combat between individuals. Like, the, the sort of ridiculousness of fighting over the vegetables, I think, aligns this with the mock epic. And that's, I think, really really clearly sort of coordinated with Nanabozo and the spirit of the trickster that that um, Weisner evokes in the beginning of the poem. So one additional irony of this, um, the only indigenous person officially killed or wounded in the Battle of Sugar Point was an Indian policeman. Now, the Indian police were indigenous people who work on behalf of the United States Indian Agency on reservations and in, and indigenous owned lands and basically they kept the peace and enforced US laws indigenous uh, policies of, of Indian agencies etc cetera, etc cetera. so they the Indian police were actually on the side of the army but the army but the soldiers did not understand that or didn't care about that and they actually shot this person um so the irony the only indigenous person killed by the u.s army was somebody who was on their side but then the last thing that i want to talk about that i think is really striking with this poem at the very end um what we get we get a series of things that i think are, are worth noting so we get one, uh, we get two stanzas here. Um, Private Wicker, who, who served at Sugar Point, um, we get two stanzas where he actually, where we, we uh, where Weisner goes over his sort of memoirs of the event. And he was basically like, yeah, we shouldn't have been there. I mean, the, the Ojibwe were fighting for their land. The pillagers were in the right, we were in the wrong. Um, so that's an interesting thing, because you don't... You don't have that many accounts, necessarily, of people, of white people, of, of white Americans or Canadians, in this period, sort of saying... Yeah, the indigenous people were right and we were wrong. Manifest destiny was a bad thing. It was genocidal. Today, we now sort of recognize that because we have the United Nations definition of genocide. And yeah, boy, howdy. The American and Canadian treatment of indigenous peoples clearly qualifies. But in 1898, people... In the U.S., in Canada, white people typically didn't think about it in that way. So the fact that Private Wicker acknowledges this is a really sort of striking irony here. Um, but that's followed immediately by depictions of 3rd Infantry soldiers looting Hole in the Day's cabin. Starting with Private Wicker stealing eagle feathers. Sacred, uh, sacred tokens. Yeah. Uh, so a number of, of different um, people from the 3rd Infantry stole things from Hole in the, Day, the Day's cabin, particularly things that had ritual significance. And then what I find really, really striking, from page 88 through to uh, page 93, to the second-to-last stanza, we have detailed information about what happens to the key players on the 3rd Infantry side. We have descriptions of uh, the people who were killed or wounded. We have descriptions of some of the leaders, um, etc., etc., and what happens to them afterwards. And we it's really only with the last stanza, the second half of the last stanza, strikingly enough, that we return to um, questions about the indigenous side of things. 
And I think that's really, really interesting because in a way that sort of mimics the historical memory where so much of, of historical memory focuses on the U.S. Army's experience in the Indian Wars. Partially this is because indig uh, indigenous experiences tend to be less thoroughly documented, but it's also because overall, I mean, at, at Sugar Point, the U.S. Army lost. The pillagers won. But overall, in the Indian Wars as a whole, the U.S. won. And so the U.S. got to tell the story. And Weisner is trying to correct this story. But it's interesting that the, the bulk of the last section of this mock epic poem focuses on the U.S. Army. I think it's an ironic commentary on the way in which the history of the Indian Wars is typically told.